Hello again. If you have just worshipped with us, then you heard me outline the movement of the Holy Spirit, taking us from a place where we are dispirited through a kind of purifying fire to a place where we can be invigorated, inspirited, inspired as we lay hold the promise of abundant life in the gospel. But in the, event of, in the events of recent days, I believe that more needs to be said. I have found myself dispirited to the point of rage, rage enough where I would myself want to take to the streets in protest, protest at the death of George Floyd under the knee of a white police officer while asking and begging for breath. He was, his life was snuffed out for no good reason that we can tell. I want to protest the incident in Central Park where Amy Cooper threatened the life of Christian Cooper, threatened him with lies when he had done something as simple as ask her to leash her dog in accordance with the bylaws of set that govern Central Park. The dog was apparently digging up shrubbery and probably scaring off the birds that Mr Cooper was there to watch. You've probably read the story. She picked up her telephone and called 911 and accused Mr Cooper of threatening her life. Maybe she astonished herself by resorting to the most basic kind of overt racism by which thousands and thousands of black men have been falsely accused of crimes and more often than not jailed for them. And I want to protest as well the most offensive president in American history who encourages white gun-toting thugs uh, protesting lockdowns and, in, and, and, and offers black protesters protesting yet another instance of police brutality, threatens them, apparently channeling George Wallace of all people, he threatens them with gun violence. Sisters and brothers, <laughs> these incidents of racism are the diametric opposite of the community we celebrate, the community brought into being by the power of the Holy Spirit, when we remember the Holy Spirit bringing a new humanity into being, a humanity in which people from throughout the known world are granted grace to hear and understand each other across all manner of difference. And the first fruit of that new creation is the church. It's us, the people of God, amongst whom there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for as St. Paul told the Galatians, you are all one in Christ Jesus. Resisting racism must start with us. It must start with us as a gospel imperative. Our resisting racism means recognizing that racism quite literally kills. Our resisting racism means coming to terms with the reality of differences in power that comes with white privilege. Our resisting racism means recognizing when we have the power in a relationship and when we do not. Which Cooper, Amy or Christian, had power in Central Park? A woman generally has less power than a man. A white person generally has more power than a black person. But here, an entitled, privileged, white investment banker woman found herself willing to use the power of white privilege to call the police and lie about a black man. So here in Central Park, and again in Minneapolis, and in many other places, that power differential gets shifted a little bit through the, the, the balance of power gets shifted through video, where we see and witness the ugliness of racism. Doesn't matter if it's conscious or unconscious, it's ugly. Our resisting racism means also our getting in touch with some part of our own lives in which we can remember what it's like not to have the power in a relationship, in fact, to be powerless. This can be particularly hard for privileged white men like me. We might have to go back to our childhood to find a time where we really didn't have power. And then once we've remembered what it feels like, then we can imagine what it feels like to live with that feeling every single day. Every single day, 
having to worry about our children, having to teach our sons how to act around police officers to avoid getting killed. It's called the talk. Hearing politicians, what it's like to hear politicians and other leaders denounce racism and knowing deep in our hearts that well-meaning promises do not bring about change, feels as though nothing changes. Our resisting racism also means recognizing that we are complicit, often complicit, often unwittingly. It was just a few years ago. Did we not think it reasonable for financial reasons that we might say uh, to a Spanish-speaking congregation, goodbye, goodbye, we're going to stop supporting you, we're going to ask you to leave? Not so long ago. Yes, resisting racism must begin in our hearts and then must continue at the ballot box and it must continue in holding police accountable, not just the officers at the scene in Minneapolis, but every person up the chain of command who reviewed and dealt with the 18 previous complaints against Officer Derek Chauvin and other counterparts in every police department across the country. I'm not suggesting a witch hunt, but I am suggesting that accountability and the light of day are important in bringing about change. My goodness, we have enough reasons to be dispirited today. But my earlier sermon stands. The purifying fire in whatever form is not comfortable for us, but it is necessary as, as the way to abundant life. We can and should hold up and celebrate good stories, even incremental improvements along the way. And there are some. If you haven't seen... If you haven't seen Archie Williams on America's Got Talent, do a search on YouTube. Archie Williams was released from prison in 2019 after serving 37 years for a crime he did not commit. He was exonerated by DNA evidence and eventually released. And he shares before he sings that watching America's Got Talent and imagining himself being on it, dreaming of being on that show was part of what kept him going during that 37 years of imprisonment. Yes, sometimes there can be cause for celebration, but always tempered by the reality that there is yet work to be done, spiritual work to be done. Those 37 years were still stolen from Mr. Williams by an inherently racist system. Or in another good story, Perhaps you've seen Erica Shields. You might not know her name. Erica Shields is the chief of police in Atlanta. And there are this video of her walking among protesters, denouncing the murder of George Floyd, listening to the concerns of people. At one point, she removes a, a, a white police officer who, who was being offensive. She, she talks, she listens, she, she emphasizes her concern for public safety and peaceful protest. But she's another ray of light in the midst of the tempering reality that led to the protest in the first place. Resisting racism is hard spiritual work. As those who came to our coffee hour last Wednesday will attest, we joined in responding to a sermon by Otis Moss III from Chicago. He called it the cross and the lynching tree, a requiem for Ahmad Arbery, yet another young black man murdered by white people for having the effrontery to jog in what they believed to be their neighborhood. Our conversation on Wednesday was not an easy conversation, but it's part of doing the hard spiritual work of resisting racism. And so our resisting racism goes further. Our resisting racism also means imagining what kind of society we want to live in and how we might participate in bringing it about. How do we imagine that gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost infusing the whole world, all of the societies, communities in which we live? I hope that out of this time of coronavirus, we might elect politicians of any party who will support a kind of new, new deal one that includes a year or two of national service during which young adults from every walk of life and every part of the country have to live and work together for some common purpose. 
Imagine a society that includes uh, health care and a living wage for all those who we currently look at as frontline workers, disproportionately black or brown, essential service workers, delivery drivers, grocery store clerks, and so on, not forgetting that our fragile health system uh, itself is dependent upon immigrants. We can imagine a society in which every human being can flourish in the ways promised in the gospel. Now, I'm not naive enough to suppose uh, that the kind of, that kind of vision won't be resisted by the voices of austerity. Keynesian economics are behind the, the idea of stimulus, but monetarist theories still hold sway for many people, and we can expect those voices to be loud, cheered on, perhaps by white supremacists in Hawaiian shirts carrying guns. Resisting racism, brothers and sisters, must begin with those of us who know something of the power of the Holy Spirit to inspire us, inspire us to a vision of a society born at Pentecost, a society of mutual understanding in which every single child of God can flourish. And for this, by the grace of God, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can lay hold a reasonable and holy hope. I offer this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.